So turn with me to Matthew 18. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Jesus is really starting to focus on the the real purpose, the primary reason for him coming from heaven to earth, and that was to be the sacrificial lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And starting in chapter 16, Jesus begins preparing his disciples for what awaits him. He said he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer at the hands of, oh, I forgot something. Save it till afterwards. We'll do it at the end. Just threw everybody off because I had one more thing to share, share, but we'll talk about it at the end. Okay. Anyway, (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) that part won't go in the recording, hopefully. (laughs) So Jesus told them he must go to uh, the cross. He was going to die, but he must rise from the dead on the third day. So he's preparing his disciples. And so again, he's really focusing on discipling the disciples before his death and burial and resurrection. As we'll see, they have a lot of important lessons to learn before Jesus ascends back up to heaven. So we pick up in chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now we'll look at Mark's gospel here in a moment because Mark gives us some more insights into what's happening here. Uh, This is right after Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, where he's transformed, and uh, Elijah and Moses appear to him on the mountain, and Peter, James, and John are there. They hear God's voice from a cloud. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And so they come down from the mountain, and Jesus tells them, don't say anything until after I rise from the dead. And when they come down the mountain, the other disciples are there waiting for Jesus. And there's a man that has a demon-possessed son, and they couldn't do anything about it. And so after Jesus casts the demon out of this little boy and heals him, Jesus and the disciples are walking back to Capernaum, which is their home base there on the Sea of Galilee. And this is what Mark says, Mark chapter 9, verse 33. Then he came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed or argued among themselves who would be the greatest. And so at some point, as we see here in verse 1, they get the nerve to ask Jesus, Okay, who's the greatest among us when we get into the kingdom of heaven? So they're literally been, they've been arguing about which one of them, I'm the greatest, I'm the best, I deserve to be, you know. And then even James and John's mother are going to ask Jesus, why don't you put one of my boys on this side, the other on this side, and they'll rule with you in the kingdom. And they don't even know what they're talking about. So Jesus commanded them not to tell anybody, but I'm sure James, John, Peter, they're probably thinking, well, it's got to be one of us. We just saw him transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw Moses and Elijah. So these guys need to learn their lesson on humility. So the very next thing Jesus uh, does is found in Mark 9, 35. It says, And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. In other words, instead of thinking that the disciples should be celebrities, Jesus is letting them know, no, you are going to be servants. We have way too many celebrities in pulpits, especially in America today, and not enough servants. But if you want to be great, remember this old song, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. And Jesus is the greatest example of this. You know, the one who has all power, who created the heavens and the earth, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, comes from heaven to earth, He girds his loins with a towel. He gets a bowl of water, and he begins to wash the disciples' dirty, stinky feet. Remember when he comes to Peter? Peter's like, you're not doing that to me. And Jesus said, unless I do this, you have no part in the ministry with me. So then Peter's like, okay, give me a bath. I want my head washed, my hands washed, everything. And Jesus said, no, you just need your feet. You're clean. You just need your feet washed. And so after Peter stops arguing, this is what Jesus tells them in John 13, starting in verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
You also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And the example was to be a lowly servant. That was the lowest, most demeaning job in any household was to wash people's feet. The head of the household didn't do that. Only the servant did. So Jesus says, I'm not you know, above anybody. I mean, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, but he stooped down and he ministered and he served others. He did not come to be served, he says, but he came to serve. So Peter learned this lesson. He quotes from um, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, and he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And then this is what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So I think Peter learned his lesson. You've got to humble yourself before the Lord, and he'll lift you up when he's ready to use you for what he calls you to do. Being humble before the Lord and before others. It's a very important attribute that we need to be aware of as we serve the Lord. Now, the example that Jesus uses to teach them this lesson is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the, the synoptic Gospels, and they all have verse 2. Look at verse 2. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them. Now, just pause there for a moment because it's right you know, here we usually just read over that verse, but there's a lot of amazing things in this scene here because here's Jesus, again, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the Lord God Almighty, and yet he simply calls a little child to come over to him. And without any hesitation, without any fear, this little child goes to Jesus. And Jesus sets him in the midst of his disciples. He's going to let them know, here's your example of greatness, this little child. This little child was content with who Jesus is. He's content with what Jesus asked him to do. Come here. Sit down right here. That's the example for all of us. It's like Jesus is saying, I called him. He responded to me. And when he responded, I placed him where I wanted him to be. Now, that's the problem the disciples are still struggling with because they're still thinking, I want to be great. I want to do this. I want to do that. Often we do the same thing with Jesus. You know, I want to do this, Lord. Why are you asking me to do that, Lord? No, we need to trust Him. And so, verse 2, Then Jesus called a little child, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the word converted means to be changed or to have a change of heart. None of us can convert ourselves. None of us can change our own hearts, but Jesus certainly can. That's what he specializes in. Jesus takes our wicked, sinful heart, and he gives us a new heart, one that beats for him. In fact, when we get saved, Jesus gives us a new heart. He calls us new creations in Christ. Now, when Jesus says he must, we must become as little children... It doesn't mean we become childish. It means we become childlike, and there's a difference. I mean, I can get stupid, and I can say childish things. You know, we're going to show a scene here at the end that I didn't, I forgot about Africa, and Mark's going to be going to Africa in a couple weeks. And so I went to the same place where Mark went in Nairobi years ago, and I haven't been back since. I don't think they invited me back because I get before all these pastors and I'm like, Jamba! I mean, it's a common greeting. It's like, Aloha! Except for they don't say Jamba. They say, Jambo! And then I say, Jambo! Or I didn't say, I say, Jamba! And they're like, oh. <laughs> and then I asked the interpreter, so what's wrong? How come they're not responding? You just said, Jamba, that means to pass wind. Sorry! <laughs> so that's why I go to Northeast India with Emily because I don't try to say any of their words. I just I let him do the interpreting. <laughs> so that was off topic. But Jesus wants us to be as 
children with that simple, humble faith, just like a child trusts their loving mom and dad. Jesus wants us to have that simple trust in faith in our loving Savior. Unless you have that simple faith and trust in Jesus, notice at the end of verse 3, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, verse 4, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So do you want to know who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says it's whoever humbles himself. It's the one who yields to the king. It's the one who trusts fully in the shepherd's voice and obeys what Jesus tells us to do. Verse 5, whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. When Jesus says in my name, that means in his nature, his character. And we'll look more at this, Lord willing, next time. But whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Now this must be blowing the minds of these disciples because they've been arguing which one of them is the greatest and which one of them is most important. And they're probably thinking, man, we're 30 years old. And why you tell us we have to be like a little child? But again, to become a citizen of heaven, it's 180 degree opposite of the ways of the world. The world says you've got to work, you've got to sweat, you've got to climb over people. If you want to get ahead, you've got to do whatever it takes to make a name for yourself. Jesus says, no, that's not how to get into heaven. You humble yourself as a little child. You come to me, you trust me, and I will bring you into glory. By the way, here in verse 5, we see how highly Jesus values little children. He loves the little children. Psalm 127, verse 3, it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And as a creator, Jesus is very much concerned about all the little babies in the womb. He's concerned about all babies outside the womb. At the same time, Jesus is concerned about everybody, no matter how young or old we are. So look at verse 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now this is heavy duty. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin... Jesus uses different words for little child and little ones, but they both can be little ones as far as age, but also they can be little ones as far as maturity. They can be like a new believer would be considered a little one, a young Christian, young in the faith. In other words, those who have humbled themselves like a child and received Christ. So the warning is twofold here. Be careful how you treat Children, they're very precious in the eyes of the Lord. Be very careful how you treat believers in Christ. They're very precious in the eyes of the Lord. So this is a warning against our culture that is turning away children from God. They're saying, yeah, there is no God. Public schools. They're saying, you're just a product of billions of years of evolution. They're saying, oh, whatever biological sex you are, it's more than male or female. They're up to whatever, 90 identities you can choose from, which is nonsense. Believe the science. Well, you take DNA from anybody, whatever they look like, and it's going to say male or female. There's only two choices. That's why Jesus says here, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, that whoever would include ungodly parents, ungodly school administrators, ungodly teachers, ungodly board members, ungodly political leaders... What about child traffickers who use and abuse children and teens? Do you think they will escape God's wrath and judgment? No way. This would also include all the false prophets, all the false teachers that are coming against the Lord's children by twisting the Scriptures, by exploiting them, by trying to get them to follow them instead of trying to get them to follow Jesus and stay close to the Lord and trust in the Word of God. Notice what Jesus says of all those people who cause these little ones to sin. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. He's talking about the Sea of Galilee because they're in Capernaum. 
Sea of Galilee is about 140 feet deep. And for those of us who've been over there, um, we've seen a lot of examples of millstones. Go ahead and put that on the screen because uh, Capernaum, this, these are millstones. Um, the, the word Jesus used for millstones, it actually means the stone of a donkey. Because they'd have an ox that would pull a millstone, and then they have a donkey that would pull a millstone. These things weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And so if you're going to cause a little one who believes in Jesus to sin, he says it would be better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck and be tossed into the sea. It wouldn't take very many seconds for somebody to have one of these tied around them and sink to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus says it would be better for that person to die this way than to cause one of his little children to stumble in sin, that kind of death would be better than what? It'd be better than everlasting fire. That's what Jesus says. That's what he's now going to speak about. But don't think that Jesus is being wicked. Don't think Jesus is being, you know, harsh. Well, he is harsh, but he's not being, you know, hardcore as far as he loves unrepentant sinners. That's why he came to die for unrepentant sinners, that they would hopefully see their need for Jesus and repent, turn to Christ for salvation. He's just stating that drowning by a millstone around your neck would be better than ending up in the lake of fire. And so don't picture Jesus here, you know, like, oh, the Godfather, you know, you mess with me, I'm going to put your feet in some cement and drop you in the ocean. No, he's not being the Godfather, but he's speaking on behalf of God the Father who loves people, who is righteous and holy in all of his ways, including his wrath, Verse 7, Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Here Jesus pronounces a woe. That's a warning. He's pronouncing a warning to the world because of offenses. The word offenses, we saw this earlier in Matthew, it means an enticement to sin. It's the bait in a trap that entices whatever they're trying to catch into that trap. That's the word offenses here. That's exactly what the wicked world does, and that's what they use to lure children, to entice young people into sin. They dangle the bait in front of them, trying to get them to go towards the bait, and then they will ensnare them. It sounds a lot like clickbait, on our phones and computers. Be careful. Don't click on that bait. The enemy is trying to lure people of all ages onto, why is it called the World Wide Web? You get hung up in it. There's a lot of good things about the internet, but there's a lot of stuff you got to be careful of because there's a lot of lies, deceit, and sin. So Jesus is saying, this is not my kingdom. This is the way of the world, but woe to the world because of the way it tries to destroy lives. Again, as the creator of the heavens and the earth, as a creator of life, God created life, and he says it begins at conception, in the womb. This is very clear from the scriptures. Beware, woe to those who practice destroying lives, even the littlest ones, in the womb after all, God creates every human being with purpose and calling. So again, woe to that man, that individual, that person by whom the offense comes. Some of you have heard of Margaret Sanger. I would hate to be in her shoes. A hundred years ago, last year was her hundred year anniversary. Woo! She's the one that started Planned Parenthood. Her intention was to bring in eugenics and uh, eliminate, and she's very clear about it, she wanted to eliminate what she called the Negro race. That was her purpose in starting it. She wanted to wipe out black people from America. They were inferior in her eyes. That's why she wanted to start this. That's why you see even today in many inner cities, that's where Planned Parenthood goes because they're still trying to do these things. Most abortions, almost 50% of all abortions, are with black babies. That is a woe from the Lord to those who are doing these things. Hillary Clinton, a few years back, was given the Margaret Sanger Award, and she praised Margaret Sanger. How wonderful that, that, that woman was. Wouldn't want to be in her shoes either. Unless they repented or repent, 
I would not want to be in their shoes before God. One of the most beautiful examples of God working in the womb, seeing His plans, His purposes come to fruition. Look at these verses in Jeremiah chapter 1, starting in verse 4. This is what God tells Jeremiah as he's preparing him for ministry. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God's omniscient, he even knew Jeremiah before he was conceived. Before you were born, so while he's still in the womb, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy to throw down, to build, and to plant. I mean, isn't that amazing? And you look at Jeremiah. He was just a simple guy. He was just a normal kid growing up in Judah and lived in Jerusalem area. And yet he was there during a time when it was wickedness in the land. The ten northern tribes had already rebelled against God, taken up into captivity. Judah was starting to do the same sinful things that Israel was doing. And so he felt totally inadequate to his calling and the purpose God had for him. But God touched his mouth. God changed his heart. And Jeremiah would become an amazing prophet, a voice for the Lord for the next 40 years. And he would be abused. He'd be thrown in prison. He would want to give up at times, and yet he couldn't. The Lord just kept using him, and he was there when King Nebuchadnezzar came down from Babylon, wiped out uh, Judah, destroyed Jerusalem, leveled the temple, took, off a took a bunch of the Israelites up into the land of Babylon. He saw it all. But all that Jeremiah became was set in motion by the Lord long before... Jeremiah knew anything about anything. Think of that. God knew him before the womb. God sanctified him in the womb. God ordained him as one of God's prophets, as a voice and spokesman for the Lord. So, question is, who are we to challenge when life begins? Yet we do. Who are we to say, that preborn baby is just a bunch of tissue? Or that life doesn't begin until birth? Or, as some politicians are now starting to do, that woman has a choice to make even after the baby's born. As soon as the baby's born, they can still make a decision whether they want the baby to live or die. Are you kidding me? The great news is Jesus is still willing and able to save and forgive anybody, no matter what they've done. I mean, I've got a list of sins before I got saved. You want to take a scroll of my sins, all the way out the door. But God forgave me completely. You know, you may have had an abortion. God can forgive you completely. And some of you that I know have, you've been forgiven completely. And that's the good news of what Jesus Christ can do. His blood is sufficient to cleanse us and wash us and make anybody's heart of sin a heart that beats for Jesus, that lives for Him. And so I encourage you, don't hang on to guilt and shame any longer. Turn it over to the Lord. He loves you. He died for no matter what you did. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone, that word anyone means anyone. <laughs> doesn't matter how many sins you've committed, how few, how big, doesn't matter. If anyone is in Christ, is in, if anyone is in Christ, it means you're saved. You come to Jesus for salvation. Anyone. He is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's God's promise to anyone who will come to Christ no matter what. Look at verse 8. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin... 
pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Now, if this sounds harsh, it's because it is harsh. Jesus is making a very important point. Notice again that he says it is better for you to have this happen to you. Cut off your hands, your feet, pluck out your eye. It would be better to do that than to be cast into everlasting fire. Literally means Gehenna, the place that always burns. So Jesus is telling the wicked sinners who are doing these horrible things to children to repent. In other words, deal with your sins in a radical way, in a harsh way. Now we are to deal with other people who sin against us with humility, with grace, gentleness, and truth, but we need to be harsh on ourselves. And this is the opposite of the world. The world says, oh no, harsh with others, pamper yourself. That's not the way of Jesus. He wants us to deal with our sins in a radical way. Cut it off, rip it out, crucify it. Don't pamper your flesh when it comes to sin. Deal with it. We need to see sin as the invisible cancer that it really is. It needs to be cut out, removed, radiated, destroyed, because sin is what leads to death. The Bible is very clear about that. Now, we know Jesus is not speaking literally about chopping off body parts, plucking out eyes, ripping out your tongue, or anything else. We saw this back in chapter 5 when he's going through the Sermon on the Mount, and he says these same words, but he tells us sin begins in the heart. That's why we need a heart transplant. If I started chopping off every body part, if I sin, I'd be a stump. I'd be even, I wouldn't be able to talk. I wouldn't, it'd just be uh, nothing left. He's dealing with the heart. The heart of the issue is our sinful heart. That's why he wants to change our hearts, give us a new heart. When a person surrenders their life to Jesus, it's like he does a, a spiritual heart transplant within us. But even now as Christians, we must be willing to... Paul deals with this. Look at Romans 6, crucify the flesh. Colossians chapter 3, he talks about putting off the old man, putting on the new cutting off, crucifying, taking off these sinful things in God's eyes. That is simply part of the spiritual warfare that we are presently in. The battle is ongoing, but our enemy is always the same. It's the world, it's Satan, but I know for me, my biggest enemy is my flesh. And that's what he wants us to continually deal with. It's infinitely better to enter the kingdom of heaven, bruised and beaten because we wrestled and fought against our sinful flesh. We denied ourselves, take up our cross daily, die to our flesh, than to spend eternity in hell because we refuse to repent and turn to Jesus who alone can forgive us. Verse 10. I told you this was a heavy chapter. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven... Their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So here he warns the people to be careful how they treat children because the angels are always there seeing the face of my Father who's in heaven. Some see this as, you know, children having a guardian angel, which I think is true. Some see this as just angels sent by the Lord to serve God's people. That's true. Here Jesus pictures the angels as always before the Father. They're close to the Father, seeing Him face to face. You know, it's one of those things that I don't know. I don't know how it all works. But I know before I got saved, there's times I should have been dead. There's things I did that I, there's no way I should be here. And so I can imagine, okay, okay Jeff's going to get saved on November 30th, 1977. Boom, go rescue him protect him, or whatever. I mean, I don't know. I want to see it when I get to heaven. How did that work, God? How did you spare me? But this is what Hebrews 1.14 says about angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So even before you get saved, I'm sure there's angels that watched over you. God's Word certainly seems to indicate these angels are also assigned to protect us. They watch over us, Psalm 91, verse 11. 
It says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. I'm sure a lot of us have had encounter with angels. I couldn't say, oh yeah, this was, but I know a lot of people have had encounter with angels that they never knew as an angel until later they're like, that could have been an angel. I was out in the middle of nowhere, ran out of gas, and all these people showed up, and they're going to kill me, and all of a sudden an angel comes by and fills up my gas tank, and I drive away. I mean, you hear all these you know, interesting stories. Well, this is what it says, Hebrews 13, verse 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly or unknowingly entertained angels. So the bottom line is be careful that you do not despise these little ones. Why? Because God is watching out for them. God is watching what we do. But the amazing thing is God would rather save a lost sinner than throw them into the lake of fire. How do we know? Well, look at verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Again, this is the primary purpose for Jesus Christ coming into this wicked world. He's come to save the lost. Who are the lost? Every single one of us. Every single person born. Paul tells us in Adam, because Adam and Eve are the first ones, because of their sin, their sin's been passed down to every single human being. So in Adam, he says, all die. But in Christ, all should be made alive. So when you come to Christ, he saves you. So who are the lost? Every person. Romans 3.10. Look at these verses quickly. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every single one of us. Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for you to clean up your act and then, okay, now you can get saved. Are you kidding? I had no act to clean up. I was a wretched sinner. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. That's what we've earned because of sin. But the gift, and it literally means the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise the Lord. So make no mistake about it, Jesus did not come into this world, this sinful world to destroy sinners. That's not why He came, but to save us, to save sinners. That's why He came, to save those who were lost. This is perfectly summed up in John 3, 16 and 17, the most famous verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in Him should not perish. The word perish means to be destroyed, but to have everlasting life. And then verse 17 says, For God did not send His Son into this world to condemn the world, praise the Lord, but that the world through Him might be saved. So He didn't come here to condemn. He came here to save. That's what His first coming is all about. When He comes a second time, yes, He will judge, He will destroy. But He came the first time as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus gives us an example of this here in a moment with the parable of the lost sheep. And as we look at this parable, think of what I just quoted during communion, Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Verse 12, Jesus says, What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? So when he asks the disciples here, What do you think? He's challenging them to think about why he came to earth. What do you think? Am I like the religious leaders in Jerusalem who want to condemn those who sin? Am I like the religious leaders in Jerusalem that say all Gentiles are nothing but fuel for the fires of hell? That's what they believed. What do you think? Good question. Jesus is getting to the heart of his ministry here. All that Jesus says is because He loves people. All that He went through, His beating, His suffering on the cross, the torture, everything is because He loves people. So what do you think? 
This is such a beautiful picture of the chief shepherd. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. He's going after, he's pursuing a sheep that has gone astray. Look at it, it says he leaves the 99. No doubt in a safe and secure place. He goes into the mountains, it says he seeks the one who has gone astray. I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people can relate to this. They went astray. Even after getting saved, they went astray. They started getting caught up in things that they knew they shouldn't. They got beaten up. They got beaten down. But God didn't give up on you. I've known a lot of Christians who have gone astray. Paul says they're backslidden, carnally minded. Just read 1 Corinthians 2 and 3. In our own abilities, in our own weaknesses, we might look at wandering sheep who went sideways in their faith, and we might think, good riddance, I hope you get what you deserve. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. That's not the heart of Jesus. He goes after them, he pursues them, because they are his sheep. In the next section, Jesus is going to talk about how to deal with a sinning brother. That's a different issue. But here he's just talking about going after those who have wandered. The primary purpose of church discipline, as we'll see, it's Galatians 6, one, restoration. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So here Jesus is showing his disciples the love, the concern that he has for all of his children. Look at verse 13. We'll wrap it up here in a moment. And if he should find it, Jesus says, this wandering, straying sheep, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Again, God loves you. Jesus rejoices when wayward sheep are found, are restored, are brought back to the fold. The Bible is clear that God does not desire for people to perish. And that's the same word used in John 3.16. To perish means to be destroyed. That's not his desire. He doesn't want to see people, he doesn't want to see Christians destroyed temporarily. He doesn't want to see anybody destroyed eternally. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What's the truth? Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He wants us to have that knowledge of the truth so we can be saved by coming to Christ for salvation. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness. I mean slow concerning His promise. But is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's His will. That's His desire. But He's not going to force anybody into the kingdom of heaven. He knows who's going to get saved. He knows who's going to reject. But his desire is for all people to come to repentance, to turn to Christ for salvation. He didn't come here to cast people in the depths of darkness and despair and the lake of fire. He came to set captives free. There's an old saying that um, you know Jesus doesn't want anybody in the lake of fire. In fact, people are going to have to step over him to get into the lake of fire. That's how much he loves us. This theme of the lost sheep, the wandering sheep, I should say, the one that went astray, it's, it's found in the Gospel of Luke as well. And in fact, there's three examples Luke gives us. This one of the parable of the lost sheep. Then there's the parable of the woman that loses the coin. You know how she looks around frantically and she finds it and rejoices when she finds the lost coin. My favorite, though, and we're going to close with this, it's found in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11, the parable of the lost son. I'll try to go through this quickly. I'll try not to make too many comments, but notice Luke 15, starting in verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. 
So he divided to them his livelihood. So he gets his inheritance early. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Prodigal simply means wasteful living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Probably the lowest job you could have especially for a Jew. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, literally means carob pods, and no one gave him anything. I mean, you talk about a guy that has zero hope. He has no peace. He has no love. He's lost everything. Verse 17, But when he came to himself, that means the light bulb went on, and he starts to think about, notice, When he came to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to uh, bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That's humility. If I just ask my father, maybe he'll let me come back as a slave. I mean, I don't deserve to even be called his son anymore. I know those that have been prodigals in our church, they've wandered off. They got caught up in things they know were wrong. They came back, and I had a guy recently call me up and said, Pastor Jeff, you think I could come back to church? And I was like, well, of course. I don't care all that you've done and everything else. God loves you. He died for you, and he's been coming back. It's been awesome because he's this guy. You're his son. He loves you. You know it. Verse 20, And he arose, came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's a good thing. He's not doing a body slam on his son here. Not breaking his neck. He just fell. It just means he embraced his son. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight... And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. We'll close there.